Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Got Mental Health Podcast. I am your co-host, Rachel Cove. I am a multi-passionate entrepreneur, author, artist, mother, and certified recovery coach. I'm your co-host, Arthur Mogilevsky, entrepreneur, girl dad, animal activist, and owner of AM Healthcare, a premier substance abuse and mental health treatment program. With the collective experience of 21 years working in the mental health field, we are excited to bring to you a safe and fun place to talk all things mental health. We will be interviewing experts, thought leaders, entrepreneurs, and professionals in the entertainment industry to better educate, inform, and inspire our community to have positive mental wealth. Welcome back to the Got Mental Health Podcast. My name is Rachel Cove. I am your co-host, along with my other co-host, Arthur Mogulski. Mogulski, Rachel, please what? get it straight. I'll never get it straight. It's okay. <laughs> uh, today, we are going to be talking with Thomas M. Sterner. He is the author of The Practicing Mind, Fully Engaged, and most recently, It's Just a Thought, Emotional Freedom Through Deliberate Thinking. The CEO of the Practicing Mind Institute, Sterner is an in-demand speaker and coach working with high-performance industry groups and individuals, including athletes, to help them operate effectively in high-stress situations and experience new levels of mastery. Prior to writing the best-selling The, the Practicing Mind, Sterner studies, studied Eastern and Western philosophy and modern sports psychology and trained as a jazz pianist. He lives in Wilmington, Delaware. Visit him online at www.tomsterner.com. Welcome to the podcast, Tom. Thank you very much. Welcome, it's great Tom. to be here. Yeah. So your book, It's Just a Thought, came into my life at the most perfect time, which I find books always do. And I want to say thank you for writing this book because it very much helped me with my own relationship to my thoughts, which I feel like I've been in a very on and off toxic relationship with, <laughs> uh, for a good portion of my life. So the first question I have is, why did you write this book? And what impact did you want it to have on your readers? Well, the reason I wrote the book was I looked at, I always looked at the other two books. This is the end of the trilogy, um, if you want to put it that way. Uh, the Practicing Mind, which was the first book, was really helping people to understand the difference between um, being in your thoughts and being the observer of your thoughts, because there is no power unless you get to that position. You can't change what you're not aware of. And most people spend their day being thought rather than being the thinker of their thought. And they're not even aware of it because well, they've been doing it their whole life. And I was no different. Uh, so it feels normal. But once you begin to experience being outside of your thoughts and actually realizing that <clears throat> I am not my thoughts, I have thoughts and some of them I do create, uh, but most of the ones that I have during the day are not my, they're not created by me and I'm just living them. So that was really the practicing mind. Fully engaged was really kind of an extension of that. Uh, it's just a thought. The A lot of the research that I spent about two years researching that book, and much of what was in there, it was not actually even available, <clears throat> or it was in it, uh, it hadn't coalesced uh, when I was writing the other two books. And what we have now, you know, through our empirical science is a real, I think, a very strong and clear awareness of the interaction between our conscious mind and our subconscious mind and who's in charge. <clears throat> How to get a handle on that, what it feels like to be outside of that, and what the mechanics of that whole system works. For example, you know, your subconscious mind really deals with feelings, it, um, not so much words. <clears throat> so it's watching, it's aware of the feelings that a certain scenario is making you experience. And it correlates the two. So if um, a certain situation makes you nervous, then the subconscious mind notices the feeling and notices the situation. And then it basically writes a program that uh, when you're stimulated with that situation or something very similar, it's it thinks, it always assumes that what you're giving it is the truth. It's not, um, <clears throat> it has no critical thinking skills. It doesn't have a sense of humor. It doesn't do anything. It's just a very elegant and accurate recorder that is running all the time. So you are basically programming your reality all the time just because you're not aware 
that that is the system and that that is how it works doesn't mean it's not working. It <clears throat> So what it does is it looks at that um, relationship between those two, writes a program for it. The next time the stimulus that's very similar to that or exactly like it comes up, it just goes and gets that file off the hard drive and plays it. And then you experience the, the feelings again, the thoughts again, <clears throat> and you're basically a puppet. And that's why I tell people, you know, you need to learn – that you can be the thinker of the thought or you can be thought. And most people spend their days being thought. I think neuroscience says about 95% of the day we're actually just living uh, programs. We're reading, you know, we're just experiencing programs. We're not actually the conscious choice maker. And, you know, a story I've told many times, just because it's kind of amusing, is that I did have a, a CEO one time and we were having this conversation and he said he didn't agree with the modality. He didn't believe that that actually was actually the way that he operated and that he felt like he was the decision maker and the choice maker and that he was thinking, uh, willfully thinking everything that was going on. <clears throat> and so I, when he finished this sentence, I based, I just said, well, you know, I didn't tell you to talk. So just shut up and sit there until I do tell you to talk, until I do tell you to talk. Well, of course he was insulted and defensive, uh, which was, really just me making a point. And I asked him, I said, did you decide to react that way? Or did you just react? And it was an awakening for him. I said, you know, there was no conscious choice there. You didn't choose to react the way that you did to my comment. I said, I knew that my tone of voice would um, set off, uh, it would, you know, your subconscious would hear it, and it would say, well, how do we respond to someone talking to us this way? And it would go and get that program and run it, and you would dutifully be in it. And it would, like I said, it was a real awakening for him because he realized that he really had no choice in that and that he um, wasn't even aware that he had fallen into the program. So he was living the program instead of observing it. So I think that this is what the the third book is really about because our empirical science has gotten to a point where it's able to not only um, explain these things, but we can see it. I mean, we can see it with, because we, we, in the West, we always feel better, you know, when like when we have this science behind it with data and the data, we have got pictures and MRI images and stuff like that that can show you, look, this is what's happening to you in your brain when this is going on. Here's the electromagnetic energy that's coming out of you when you're thinking, all this sort of stuff. And so we're like, oh, yeah, I can invest in this now. Uh, even though this stuff has been going on in the East for thousands of years, but now we're comfortable with it because we can empirically prove the um, the whole situation. I have a question because there's there's this constant uh, you know back and forth between your subconscious and your conscious and what your what decisions you're making subconsciously and then um, how much of it is a conscious decision. From what you're from what I'm gathering from what you're saying, it all starts from the subconscious. The subconscious formulates the the narrative of what's happening in front of you or, or what has occurred to you. It doesn't put words to it, but it can paint the picture. And then your conscious mind puts the words and the meanings behind it and into a reaction, correct? Yeah, except that it, I think it's important to understand that the, the conscious mind um, <clears throat> creates the scenario and the feelings and the, and the subconscious just records that. Just and, record. um, it just, you know, it records that and, and then it basically plays it back on demand. So would you would you what would you state that the subconscious is biased or truthful? The the subconscious is neither. It's neither. accurate. That's exactly. what it is. Okay. It basically it looks at um it doesn't think it doesn't it doesn't care if the reaction that it plays upsets you. It's not even aware of it. Mm. it that's not you know what it does. It's just it, like I said it's a recording system that's extremely accurate very elegant and it runs all the time. And so if you're not aware, like I, f I find what I tell people is, you know, when you react, to, when you're feeling uncomfortable in a situation, um, somebody comes in a room, it triggers you or whatever. One of the things that you can say to yourself is that, isn't this interesting? This is how I told myself to react mm -hmm. in this situation because that's where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. You have told it. What, just because you don't know that you're telling it that doesn't mean you're not telling it that. And I also think we should 
make the point that we need the subconscious mind. The subconscious mind is a million times faster than the conscious mind. And that's why it takes over in the fight or flight situation. You don't have to learn how to button your shirt every day or feed yourself or so many things because the subconscious watches these things and then stores the behavior so you don't have to relearn it all the time. So it's not, it, it is, it's um, we need it, and it's not it's not a problem. It's only a problem when we aren't aware of how it works, and so we are basically becoming a prisoner of it. Right. I go ahead. Go ahead. No, sorry. I love that you use the word prisoner because in your book you talked about being a victim of your thoughts rather than being the master of your thoughts, and I often feel like I'm a victim of my thoughts. And I'm one of the most positive people I know <laughs> and have been reading books like this for 16 years. And I'm curious why you feel like our subconscious mind is programmed with such negative thoughts. Well, I think it's programmed, you know, you don't notice things that you're good at because they flow effortlessly. Where you, where you, pay attention or, or when it's brought to your attention, stuff that you experience as struggle. So and now I would consider that negative, um, or most people would. So what ends up happening is, is that, you know, it, it, it's not that it doesn't record the good things too, but you just don't pay attention to them because they don't take any effort. Um, you know, when you, when you come up against something that pushes back, that's when you start to pay attention. You say, "This, this is. I'm not comfortable. This, this feels uncomfortable. This feel. This makes me upset. This makes me sad. This makes me angry. This makes me anxious. I'm worried. All those things are really much more noticeable because they're not comfortable. So it's not that the subconscious only stores bad stuff. It's just that's what you notice. Does that make sense? It is. I, you also talked about automated thinking. And I really want to delve into that. First, I'd like you to define what automated thinking is. Well, automated thinking is <clears throat> where, um, you know, you practice a certain behavior. That behavior becomes automated. Now, the reason, um, you know, the subconscious, <clears throat> if you think about your mind, if you were to think about it like a computer, a com you know, your computer has so much RAM in it. Uh, and uh, even in... You know, even on a smartphone, you have so much RAM, and that's you know, pro and you have processor power. So when the the one of the values of the subconscious is that it watches to see what is being repeated, what behaviors are being repeated over and over again. <clears throat> and when it sees something like that, it can be a physical attribute, like a motion in a golf swing, um, but it can also be a reaction to a situation or a, a certain behavior. Like, you know, you walk in the house and the first thing you do is go to the cupboard that has the dark chocolate in it. I mean, it, it could be, you know, anything like that. It watches to see what behaviors repeat it. And then it says, you know, <clears throat> we can free up RAM by habitualizing this because um, it doesn't take any energy once it becomes a habit. The problem with habits is there's no decision-making in them and there's no conscious choice-making. And at that point, it becomes automated. In an automated programming like that, you're not really a participant in it. You're just basically doing, it's just a program that's played and you engage in it. So that's what automated thinking is. And there is value to it. Again, there's value to all of this. Where it becomes a problem is um, when we are not, we, we really want to be thinking deliberately, meaning <clears throat> we, we create the thought with purpose and intention and in a, um, that is going to serve us. So, uh, you know, many times people say, well, you know, well, how do I stop this? You know, like, um, well, the first thing you have to do is you have to become the observer of this whole process that's going on. And it's actually not hard to do at all. It takes, you know, you spend about 10 minutes a day in what I'll call thought awareness training. Um, and I work with this with all of my clients, you know, uh, they do this and they always come back after about 10 days or so, and they go, this is amazing. I'm really starting to notice the difference, what it, the difference that it feels to be from being in my thoughts and just doing stuff and actually watching the thoughts happen. Um, so thought awareness training is really nothing more than a simple meditation process uh, where 
you know, there are all kinds of meditations. Um, there are guided meditations, and we don't want that for this um, because it they ask you to think, you know, they'll say, and now you're feeling your legs are relaxed or, you know, whatever it is. Um, you're getting instructions, which means you have to process the instructions. And we don't want that. What we want to do is we want to become aware of what our mind is doing without our permission, because it's a lot. And you can't change that if you're not aware of it, especially if you're in it. So what we do is we, um, that's the reason why I've called it thought awareness training. It's just to learn what, what your mind is doing. <clears throat> now, what, um, what this does is it gives you the the key to the prison door. It gives you the privilege of choice because once you begin to notice what your mind is doing, then you can make the decision uh, as to, you know, you're the gatekeeper of your thoughts. That's what you should be. Um, that's the freedom comes from noticing what your mind is doing and making a decision that you're not going to allow this thought to pass through. Now, <clears throat> you know, people can say, well, yeah, that sounds all good, but, you know, it's not easy to do. Well, first of all, nothing is e – it's a skill, and no skill is easy when you start it. Uh, so if you – you know, like if your interpretation is I should be good at this right away, well, how many things – how many skills do you start that you're good at right away? It's a process. The mechanics are simple. You practice them over and over, and then you, you're you on a, a, a way to mastery. But what I have found is when people have thoughts – they get to the point pretty quickly where they begin to notice thoughts that they're having. And if you say to them, okay, <clears throat> when that thought shows up, if I could touch you on the head and you could have any thought you wanted instead, if you could be any person you wanted instead, if you could react any way you wanted, what does that look like? And I would tell you that, you know, 95% of the time, they don't have the faintest idea because they've never thought about it. All they've just thought is, I don't like feeling this way. So they're just in the experience. Um, they're not separate from the experience. And I said, well, you know, you have to have <clears throat> an awareness of where you want to go when that happens so that you can go there. <clears throat> you can at least try to go there. Like, uh, that's why we have, if you look at um, what you're doing in that moment is you're reacting. What we want is a response. To me, a response has decision-making um, conscious choice making, will is your will is involved. When this happens, I am going to do this. That's what my will is is dictating. A reaction is just that you just react, and that's why I say you know we call them first responders. We don't call them first reactors <clears throat> because they they already know when they go into a situation. They have a pretty good idea of what they're going to do. They they can think of several different scenarios, like you know coming up on say a car accident. Well, they have um, they have an idea. Okay, if it's this, I'm going to do that. If it's this, I'm going to do that. And what I find so many times when people are being prisoners of their thinking, if you ask them, well, okay, well, the first thing we got to do is figure out. Um, give me an example of a situation that repeats. You know, where you react in a certain way and it makes you upset, and you want to change it. Okay, so what would you like to do in that situation? Well, they just look at you. And so once you come up with um, a you know a some idea of this is how I want to react. If I could react any way I want, this is how I want that. Well, now you have a target. And, and then the next thing is because the behavior is so automated, it's so habitualized, you have repeated it millions of times and your subconscious is thinking like, well, this is what you asked us to do. Now you want me to stop doing this? Like um, I've done it thousands of times. And you have to have something to kind of intercept that because it ha you're going to get a lot of pushback <clears throat> because you have installed this and you've become you've actually mastered it you've practiced it over and over again like a scale on a piano that's why it's the the um that whole cycle flows so effortlessly so in order to um first you have to decide okay this is when that happens this is what I'm going to do and then in order to give you an edge up on that you need what I call a rescue mantra you need something that when you notice you're outside of the thinking. You notice your mind is going in this direction. You can say something like, uh, this is when the fun starts or game on or whatever it is to yourself that kind of intercepts the, the momentum of that um, the habit that is trying to be expressed. And that gives you a second to then drop into a procedure that you have decided outside of that, that you want to execute in that moment instead so that you can begin to uh, craft a new reaction. So many repetitions of that is going to create a new reaction to that. It's it's actually pretty amazing. And once you experience the process and you see it work, 
it really becomes a sense of freedom because you realize that you are not <clears throat> obligated um, to any particular reaction. Uh, you can change it to be whatever you want. Would you say that there's, you know, because you mentioned it before, when people start working with you, they want the solution right away, right? They're like, well, just just give me the answer. Let me think this way. I want to be an expert immediately, right? So um, what I'm hearing is that there's a lot of meditation. There's a lot of mindfulness. There's a lot of connection to the thoughts, right? Living in the moment. I know for me personally, when I try to meditate for five or 10 minutes, I have billions of thoughts that are flowing through my mind. What I've gathered is that I should not be suppressing them and trying to quiet my mind, but let them flow in and out until I get to a place with enough repetition where it, it starts to kind of move away. Would you say that that... You know that is the best kind of practice and and typically is there a science behind you know breaking habits and how long that typically takes and is it varied between the type of habit you're trying to break well you know that's a really good point that what you make about the meditation so <clears throat> let me clarify something on meditation for this purpose here because there are different types of meditation we're not trying to create um a, a perfectly still mind. As I said earlier, we're trying to notice what what the mind is doing. Now, what you said, you have a billion thoughts, and um, that is meditation. You know, the practice of meditation to me, where people fall off and and fall down and lose interest in meditation, is that they um, misunderstand what they're trying to accomplish in this in this um, particular scenario. <clears throat> when you sit down and let's just say it's a simple breath meditation where your your will is telling your body is telling your mind i want you to watch i want you to watch my body breathe that's what that's your task and why do we do that well you give your body you give your mind a single task so you have a point of relativity right as to whether it's doing what you're asking it to so then what happens okay well you sit down and you you um you start out there and 10 seconds later your mind which is a problem solving machine says this is boring and I'm going to go work on the report I got to get done or think about what I need at the grocery store or whatever it is. <clears throat> and it takes off and you take off with it because that's what you've always done. And you aren't far enough along at this point to uh, be aware of that instantly. That comes with, with some time. Well, what is actually happening there? Well, actually that's the, what, that is the whole point of the meditation. When your mind takes off and you catch it, and you, you wake up. Um, now, your mind may be, have gone down this path, and it may be down that path for 10 seconds before you actually catch it. That's okay. It's the, it's the process of catching it. Yeah. When you catch it, that's when your consciousness anchors in the observer. It, 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 it leaves the thought and goes out of the thought and becomes the observer of the thought. That's what we're after. And then when you pull the mind back, and basically tell it, I want you to focus on my breath. Like um, now you've you've brought in your will into the equation. So you've woken up, you've re-anchored with the observer, and then your will is being strengthened by pulling the the mind back. So when people they go like, oh my gosh, I had like a you know a billion thoughts and I'm chasing my mind. Great, that's okay. Like um, you're gonna have because that's a bunch of reps, like bunch of reps at the gym. Every time you do that, you're um, anchoring and you're getting a repetition of leaving the thought, becoming anchored in the observer, the noticer of the thoughts, and developing the power to pull the mind back on cue so that it's doing what you what you want it to do. Now, you know, I've meditated for many decades and all kinds of meditations, and I can tell you that some days my mind is still, it's out of control. And other days, it's relatively placid. And I don't judge that, and I don't look at it as any indication of where I am in the practice of meditation. You know, meditation, one of the things that people have a problem with it is they think they're going to master it. Well, they're a master of it when they start. There is no, you don't, um, you know, it's not, that is not an indication of whether you're you're good or bad. Meditation to me is it's like brushing your teeth. You know, you don't say, when you're 25, well, I'm done brushing my teeth. I've been doing it all 25 years. I don't need to do it anymore. It's a part of life, and you can spare 10 minutes a day to do this, and the benefits are just unbelievable over the course of so many different activities. So what ends up happening is how does that translate into what we're talking about? Well, first of all, you have a thought which creates a feeling. You notice that. You go, this isn't where I want to go. 
and I am going to redirect my mind into the process that I have decided outside of this moment that I want to go. It's the same. It's the same cycle. You know what you're doing is you're noticing where the mind is going. You're noticing what the automated response is, and then you're commanding your mind to to let go of that that habitualized response and redirect to what you have decided in a moment of calmness and clear mindedness um, that you wanted to execute in that moment. And so you get an execution right then and there. Now, you may, when I say it takes time, you may have to do that, you know, multiple times before you surely would have to do that multiple times in the process of changing that habitual response. But, you know, people ask me, is the practicing mind mindfulness? And I, my response is, there is mindfulness in the practicing mind, but the practicing mind, mindfulness is a skill. The practicing mind is about learning to enjoy the process of becoming mindful. Uh, that's really the difference. So when, the, when I say these things take time, the reason that people shrug um, and just kind of wince is because they they want to get to the, we live in a world where we have too much on our plates we want closure to everything we want the job done we want the kids picked up whatever it is we want all this stuff done we want stuff off of our plate so we can feel like we're kind of getting ahead and the idea of this process any kind of a process it's just like well how long is this going to take but when you're there's a chapter in the book called interpretation creates experience when your interpretation of the process is where you want to be then that all goes away and you know you lose the sense of impatience because that all comes from being extremely attached to a goal. Your goal here is to get good at this, to get better at it. Well, how do you do that? Well, if you you have to practice the process, and if your goal is being in the process of practicing it, then you're always there. And you that feeling of when am I going to get good? That impatience, the sense of resistance, all that stuff just dissolves and drops away. So, you know, back to your point is is that I think that's a really great point about your mind. It's like, look, don't misinterpret um, what you're experiencing that. It's okay you know, to have a mind that's really busy. Sometimes it's going to be busy. Sometimes it isn't. And the other thing is to focus on the process of what you're doing and don't judge your um, your progress. You know, I had, I had a, a high school group one time and I, I told them that we were going to do a two minute exercise. And this is a good exercise for your listeners to do if they haven't ever tried this is I I said I'm going to set a time for two minutes I want you to close your eyes and stop thinking well <clears throat> I knew they couldn't do it but they didn't know they couldn't do it and when the two minutes was over with they were just dumbfounded um, because it was the first time in their life that they realized that um, they were willing their their mind to stop thinking and it wasn't listening to them and so I then asked them okay so who's in charge during the day because it's not you you know, you are telling your mind to do something and it's ignoring you completely. And so this is what we want to do is we want to become more deliberate about that because in my mind, that's freedom. If you're not in control of your thinking, then it doesn't matter else what else you accomplish. You're not in control and you don't ever really have freedom. Huh. That's a scary thought. Uh... <laughs> Uh, I, I should say you asked about habits, you know, about or some habits more difficult than others. Um, I guess it, it would depend. I mean, I would say like a habit of cigarette smoking is is um is certainly going to be more difficult than you know eating ch too much chocolate because of the addictive qualities of cigarettes. Right. But in terms of just regular um, habits, um, I haven't found that to be true. I, I once you understand the process and you begin to gain. When you get outside of the process, then you start to become more and more immune to the addictive qualities, the, the habitual qualities of uh, whatever the behavior is that you're trying to change. Right, because I mean, going to the cabinet to get dark chocolate on a routine, like I mean, I have my M and M things my that I go to like every night, but then comparing that to an extremely traumatic event that triggers you during, you know, things that can come up randomly throughout the day, I'm, I'm assuming the severity and the process of working through that is much more difficult. It's a much different process. Well, it, yeah, except that <clears throat> dropping into the pro – this is what I found early on. Dropping into the process of changing it can actually be an escape. Because you let go of the trauma and you're because the trauma 
is where your uh, all the emotions are. And when you let like that, what I said earlier, if I said, well, OK, how would you like to handle this? Let's focus on that. When you have the ability to redirect your mind and um, to what you want to accomplish in that moment um, in terms of change and you are able to be in the process. For me, what I have found in my life is that when I'm engaged in that and I'm, I, the, the process be, almost becomes, it's like an escape route. Like, because I cannot think about that. I can just think about the process of what I've decided I'm going to do when that happens. And it, um, uh, it, 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 re, it kind of it redirects the emotions because you're not giving the emotions any attention. You're taking the attentions off of the emotions and you're putting your attention on your intention, if that makes sense. So in the mental health industry, there's certain diagnoses, there's certain labels around thoughts. And I'm curious about your opinion around obsessive compulsive thinking as well as invasive thoughts. Do you think there's a difference between obsessive compulsive thinking and invasive thoughts? Well, I, you know, when I was young, I I was obsessive compulsive about certain things. <clears throat> um, and I overcame that, um, you know, through what I'm talking about here. I, um, I think I was that way probably, I, I started on this path as I said, as I said early on, like, you know, when I was young and I had all these ideas about stuff I wanted to do, but I didn't, I would always burn up the intensity of whatever it was. I wasn't very disciplined. Um, and I didn't, I would burn up the intensity of whatever the task was, whatever I was trying to accomplish and changing a habit could be one of those. Um, and by the time I was in a senior in high school, I was clear that my behavior <clears throat> was not under my control all the time and that I needed to do something because I wasn't very happy. And that was when I, I didn't know anything about obsessive compulsive. I just learned about it later, you know, that I was obsessive compulsive about certain things. I think that um, the, again, those thoughts, I, to me, obsessive and evasive, when I step back on, because we're, what we're talking about are labels that, you know, have been applied to certain experiences and, so for me, um, an obsessive thought is an invasive thought that you don't want. <laughs> so right. I, um, so to me, I don't know that I would draw a distinction between the two fr from my perspective. Um, they're both thoughts that are happening that you don't want to have. Now, an invasive thought may – it may be a thought that is not – I guess you could label it not as compulsive because it doesn't – it's not compelling you. Like, like for example um, – to wash your hands all the time, something like that, which would be like an OCD thing. So I think, but but for me, they both represent a thought process that if you were given the choice and I were to say, would you, if you're given the choice, would you stop this thought right now? If you could, you would say, yeah, I would. So the thought is happening to you. Both of those thoughts are happening to you. Um, and so for me, we're back to, how are you gonna change that? Um, what can you control? Well, the first thing you have to do is recognize that you're not the thoughts. Like you have to come to a conscious awareness of that. And right now, from the perspective that we're talking, I'm basically handing you a belief. I'm telling you that <clears throat> you can learn to notice that and you do have the power. Just because you haven't developed it yet doesn't mean you don't have it. Um, it's a skill. And just because, you know, if you've never taken a piano lesson, it doesn't mean you can't learn to play the piano. It's a skill. And once you understand the mechanics, if you work at it, you can change that now, you know, but you have to get outside of the, that obsessive um, behavior in order to have that opportunity to execute something that will help to dissolve that, that behavior. And I'm not, you know, I tell people when people say, well, it's difficult. Well, difficult is a word that is used. That difficult is data. In other words, it's feedback, you know, and then we we label it. This is difficult. This is easy. But it's basically feedback. And I think that people, you know, I don't mean to oversimplify it or uh, invalidate what the experience is. But if you step back and you're trying to to change something and you begin to, again, interpretation creates experience. If you begin to realize and live in the perspective of um, I am not my thoughts, 
you know, as I said, some thoughts I create, but many thoughts happen to me. And that's what obsessive or invasive thoughts are. So to me, you have to get to that and you have to experience it. Like I said, I'm handing you a belief right now when I'm saying you can learn to to change this. And I have done it with people. So I and I've done it with myself. So I'm not um, you know, I'm just not blowing smoke. I'm saying that this is possible. Um when you experience it, that's when it becomes a knowing, you know, like um, because the problem with beliefs is they always encoded in them. There has to be a certain level of doubt because you haven't experienced it yet. So it's like, you know, riding a bike. You know, if I tell you, yeah, you get on the bike and you pedal and the gyroscopic forces will hold you up. Um, it's still a belief. You look at the bike, you do know, this doesn't look like it's going to work like um, but once you ride the bike, now it's a knowing. And that doubt is completely gone because now you have consciously experienced the um, the whole process. And I feel like um, that is the way that this should be um, approached. Right. I mean, it's it's the first step is understanding that you can do it right. The, the, the mindset behind, well, this is going to be difficult. Yes, it's going to be difficult, but it's not going to be impossible. And the, the the level and 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 the the scale of difficulty it's it goes across so many different things and I usually like to like reference like I have clients that tell like they come to us that and they 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 want to stop using drugs or alcohol they want to stop abusing certain substances and and in their mind they're like well I I've, I've I've been to rehab I've done these things over and over again I can't figure it out and it's like okay well let me ask you something how long have you been struggling with mental health or substance abuse and I had a I had a young uh, young lady or I had a lady that I spoke with the other day and she said thirty years and I'm like okay well when was the last time with well, the last time you were in treatment or the times that you were in treatment how long were you in treatment for thirty days like okay so we're trying to solve something or figure out something that you've been struggling with probably three quarters of your life and trying to figure that out in 30 days. It's not to say that you're not going to be able to do it, but it's going to take a little bit more of an effort, right? And so, but the first step, as you said, is, is to identify the fact that it's not impossible, it's doable. You just have to find the willingness to do it, right? And I think, like you said, to, to catch yourself, like the process is catching yourself. I think that's when right. we catch ourselves, that's the conscious mind coming in to choose the thought or the behavior or the emotion that we want to think, feel, or do. I'm curious, do you think that there is um, an addiction to thought patterns, an addiction to even unwanted emotions? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they're comfortable because you've repeated them so many times. So there is a certain familiarity with that feeling. I mean, I I had a friend, um, you know, who was just always uh, had a very addicting. Uh, she she was a very low frequency person, attracted the wrong people in her life. And I once I said to her, you know, you're not happy unless you're unhappy. Um, you know, she was looking for if when things started to get too good, she'd make sure she did she made a bad decision, um, so that she would be uncomfortable because okay. it was you know trauma from growing up and. This was her comfort le level because this is what she had always been exposed to. So absolutely, you know, you can get addicted to that. And I, you know, I, I also don't say that um, based on what you were just talking about is that, you know, we're back to the interpretation creates your experience. You know, when you I tell people when you feel like you're struggling, what we're talking about here is skill development. And when you feel like you're struggling again, it's all that is is information that is telling you you're up against your skill threshold. In other words, you don't think about stuff that you're good at because you're good at it. So there's no resistance there. Right. When you feel like you're struggling, it means that you're up against your threshold. And that threshold is telling you, you this is as good as you are at this. So here's your opportunity to get better because you can't get better at something unless you're up against your threshold. You know, like, um, right. you know, if you, you know, like if you're, if you start out playing the piano and you're, you're starting to learn, you know, where the notes are and where the keys are and all that sort of stuff. Like, you know, 10 years from then, you know, like you got to play something like 
list Hungarian Rhapsody if you want to yeah. if you want to push your threshold. You're not going back to the the John Schwamm books, you know, where the, they had the little elves and stuff like that right. showing you where the notes were on the keyboard. You're not going to get anywhere with that. Like you're right. always going to be up against whatever your skill limit is, and that's when you're going to notice it. So you can interpret that feeling because that's what struggle. It's just a feeling, and that the feeling doesn't know that it makes you uncomfortable. The feeling is just information. You're interpreting the feeling as this is bad. Uh, I don't like it, all this stuff, but that's your interpretation. If you change that interpretation, which you can, because when you're in, when you're interpreting it like this is uncomfortable, that's because you're in the reaction, you're in the habitual response. But if you step out of that and you say to yourself, oh, this is just letting me know that I'm up against my threshold and I want to be here because this is my opportunity to push the threshold further. And you see this in sports. I mean, you see this, and obviously they're not life-threatening situations, but they may feel like it. Like, I mean, I've seen golf pros where, you know, they got to make this, um, they got to make this putter, they lose the tournament, you know, and the guys will say like, this is what I train for. I want to be in this situation. Am I scared? Absolutely. I'm scared. Do I feel all this anxiety? Yes. My knees are knocking. I can't think, but I want to be here. Otherwise I will never get better at handling this situation. So I think we're kind of wired for that. You know, we're always going to be up against whatever our skill level is. And, and I think it's important to interpret that in a way that, facilitates you with dealing with the situation. And I also think the mistake that people make, going back to what you were just talking about with your client, is that people, they tend to look at, uh, I, I, there's a chapter in Fully Engaged called um, Creating Goals with Accurate Data. Um, they tend to look at the whole the whole thing they have to accomplish, you know, like this is, I got to get off of this whole addiction thing. And it's like this, that's a ginormous a you know, thing that has to be handled and processed, you right. know, and I, I really push people to like, let's just break this down into small things that, you know, you can accomplish instead of like, don't, that's where you drive into the, them into the process. Okay. What's, what are we going to do tomorrow morning between right. when you get up and noon? What is our, what is our goal for that? Not forget about, we got to get off of the drugs. Let's just, what is our goal there that is taking us in that direction instead right. of letting them just get overwhelmed with this sense of, oh my gosh, am I ever going to be out of this? Couldn't agree with you more. Simplifying things so rather than right. overcomplicating it. I have uh, two questions. Uh, they're both separate questions, but first of all, thoughts while sleeping, subconscious or unconscious, how much weight do we give those thoughts? Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I think that most of those, some of those are... Um, the mind rearranging things. I mean, I see that all the time uh, that I don't do a lot of myself. I don't do a lot of dream analysis. I used to when I was younger, but um, I always felt like, well, there's no way for me to validate that I've interpreted this correctly. So I just right. wasn't, uh, it, it, to me, it was just like a kind of a wasted, you know, wasted effort. And I never, I didn't agree with dream symbology because I felt like, you know, different people see things like, you know, if you fell out of a tree when you were a kid and broke your arm, or if you like sitting under a tree, you know, reading a book, and you both, those two people had a dream of a tree in the middle of the road, they mean something completely different. So, um, uh, you know, so for that, you know, I think that the, um, I think that, that that stuff is the the mind reprocessing things, and sometimes there's guidance in it, um, you know, if you can figure out what that guidance is. I've noticed many times, like, if, I, if I'm watching a program and it's about snakes, I, there'll be a snake somewhere in one of my dreams, you know, right. like, um, and – what does that mean? I don't know. Like, um, was, uh, I mean, I really, I don't feel like I'm really well versed in that. Like, um, in terms of, I mean, I know the mind thinks and it, it goes into, um, different levels of thought, you know, depending on what, whether you're theta uh, or Delta or whatever, like, um, but, um, what those thoughts mean, I, I personally have not been able to get a really good handle on that. Yeah. That's fascinating. Cause I know a few people that put a lot of weight into their, their dream thoughts and it, it kind of guides their, their conscious decisions as well because they're trying to come up with an answer for that. So I'm one of them. So, yeah. So no, I, I think there's a lot of, I, I think mean, me yeah, too. I, I mean, I, I'll dream one thing one night and the next morning I'll call my friend and be like, dude, yeah, this is what <laughs> this means. This pony was flying and I was on top of it <laughs> and, and the I'm, rainbow just came out of nowhere. I think I'm the pony. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
And I won't say I have never had dreams that were very clear to me what the, the symbolism and the interpretation was. I, I, I don't want to say that, but in general, I, I've, you know, so many times I wake up and I go, what the heck was that? Yeah. Like, um, yeah, yeah. you know, like it's so disjointed and all this, these different characters and people I never met and, um, you know, or somebody I knew in high school that I wasn't even friends with you know, right. <laughs> shows up in the dream. I, I, I just don't know what to do with it. The uh, the other question I had, which is a completely different topic, uh, but it goes back to critical thinking and where our community and, and our society is headed to is, are, are you familiar with chat GBT? No, no, I'm not. Okay. So this might, <laughs> so chat GPT is it pretty much, it's, it's uh it's computer software where you plug in any question, thought, anything you want the system to develop an answer for. So let's say for instance, you want to start a business, a bakery, and you want this entire system to give you an entire breakdown with business proposals. So it's pretty much AI. So it's artificial yeah, intelligence. Say, it sounds like artificial intelligence. Yeah. So uh, it's really huge. And, and w w from what I'm gathering is that it's taking humans ability to critically think away and giving it to a computer software. Because I love the fact that you correlated our brains to, you know, a computer is really what it is. I mean, the matrix was the, the movie was built around that whole philosophy. Right. right? And so right. now we're taking this computer and putting it into the, the quote unquote, the web, the space, the cloud, whatever it is. And we're now giving the power to this, for this computer away from our mind to think for us in a sense, what are your thoughts and process uh, and ideas around that? And, Kind of I think it's headed. a bad deal. I mean, I really do. I think that, you know, like there's uh, Nicholas Carr wrote that book of what the internet is doing to our brains years ago. And he was stating that um, he was, I guess, in his 50s when the book came out. And he said, you know, he used to be a voracious reader. And he said, um, now he said, I sit down to read and 10 minutes into it, he said, I'm like, I got to go check my email. He said, you know, we're losing our ability for critical thinking and for focused thinking. We're asking our brain to process tons of data, most of which doesn't matter, right. um, you know, through texting and all this sort of stuff. It doesn't matter what your friend had for breakfast and all these other things, but it's just the volume and the, the, um, the amount of the bandwidth, you know, that the brain is being asked to function under is just grown so, so much. And it's the reason why our attention span is dropping. Um, and the other thing is that our our brain is um, evolving to be able to meet that need, but its ability to focus is atrophying, um, and that's the reason why you know our attention span keeps dropping, you know, less and less. And um, and so you know, you, to what you're you're just saying is that <clears throat> you know there's this this kind of devolving thing, you know, that is going on, and I think that. Um, uh, you're right. I, it is asking that to do that. And you see this with kids. I mean, like my older daughter is early childhood learning. And she said, these kids, have, they have no imagination. Like right. she said, because they don't have to. She said, everything is done for them. They get, you know, the video games and, you know, um, the television and everything. They don't have to imagine. They don't have to use that faculty uh, because it's all done for them. And she said, they can't, they have zero patience. They can't sit still. They can't listen long enough to get instructions. Um, and they can't entertain themselves, you know, playing, you know, j just, you know, with like a toy car or a little airplane or something. And, and it, like when I was growing up, I mean, we would, uh, yeah. I said to one guy, I said, you know, we would, we would be out in the uh, yard with these little army men. And we would have to imagine all this stuff. And he said, you had the army men. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you know, so anyway, like I said, no, absolutely. I think that that is, you know, that is really a, an issue. And I, um, and as far as the brain go, like in the computer, I think that's one of the most fascinating things that's come up is this whole heart math, you know, which has been going on now for three and a half decades. And, you know, how they've learned that the, the uh, neurocardiologists learned that the heart has the equivalent of a brain in it, which is just seems so wonky, right, right. you know, because you're thinking like, what? Like, it's just a muscle that pumps blood. No, it isn't. It has its own nervous system, its own memory. Um, and there is a communication traffic that goes on between the heart and the brain and the heart's doing 75 to 80 percent of the communicating the brain is really doing things like hormone release and um uh 
you know, your respiration and, you know, um, heartbeat and that sort of thing. But the, the consciousness, the thinking is really happening in the heart. And I would Tana look at it as, you know, the heart's like a computer. You know, you're not in your computer. You use the computer to do computations and stuff like that. But that isn't really where you are. And so this is happening. And I think one of the most fascinating aspects of it is that the um, the heart put, puts out this electromagnetic field. Uh, it actually produces electricity for the body, but it, it it's so strong that it puts out a field outside of you. And I don't know that they're really certain how far that field goes because it's a limit limitation of the technology they have but that electromagnetic field has data in it that data is your concept of yourself how you're feeling how you feel about life in general how you feel about the person that you're talking to and our neurosystem is designed to receive that information from other people so there is a very real communication going on between our hearts um much more than our brains um and that's and it's all it all functions through feelings um which obviously is part of the subconscious so the feeling is really where the information is um the words that's why i said that the subconscious looks at the feeling and then it creates the habit it's not really looking at your words and that's i think the heart math thing is really um a very good example of that because you can lie with your mouth, but your heart always looks at the truth. That's it's the truth. always producing right. the truth. How much? So, of, how much of the gut is incorporated into that? Well, I think is I think we're talking about the same thing. To be right. honest with you, I think we're talking about the nervous the nervous system in your in that area, your solar plexus area. You know, in your heart, there's a there certainly is a bundle of nerves in there, and that's where the communication sure comes out of. Um, but <clears throat> I like I said, I think. Where, you know, one of the things that they bring up is that in a lot of miscommunication occurs because there you're standing, you're standing there having a communicate a, a conversation with someone, but your hearts are having a communication too. Right. And the hearts are getting accurate information, but what's coming out of the person's mouth just doesn't have to be accurate. So then there's this confusion going on because what you're feeling isn't what the communication that's going on through between the hearts is different than what's coming out of the mouth. Um, I just think that's really fascinating. But it also says to me that we, we as as a culture, we're on the cusp of this idea, this knowledge and awareness that we have to take responsibility for what we're thinking. Because what we're thinking is like they, the example they give is, you know, a smartphone puts out an, an electromagnetic field. And in that field is data. Um, it's carrying the information. It's carrying your text, your pictures, uh, your conversation, whatever it is. Um, well, the heart's doing the same thing. It's putting that that information out there, and we're all putting that information out there. And as a collective consciousness, which we now know exists, um, if you're what's coming going out of you is fear or anger or love, all that is feeding the uh, the collective consciousness. So we we need to take responsibility for what we're thinking. Because it is impacting, um, it is impacting the world. It's not just hocus pocus talk. Yeah, and the and the scary part is that there's such there's so much misinformation out there, and there's so much propaganda and so much, you know, manipulative man information. Manipulative you know, like, information um, where you don't even know what's real or not, and you're taking that in as face value as real, right? Because we don't have a filter that can tell us. I mean, we do and we don't, right? But like, especially if it's online these days and with the manipulation of media and photos and videos and, and words, we're taking them at face value and then we're having to process whether it's real or not. And But we're making decisions and we're we're formulating thoughts and ideas and, and putting it out there based off of that misinformation. That's scary I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I think that um, the what I tell, you know, my clients, you know, at times is, look, the heart has access to the truth. Um, it sounds it sounds like fairy tale stuff, but it is peer reviewed science, and um, it's taken us a while. Now they've known this in the East for thousands of years. You know the problem with empirical science, which is what we go off of, is that it, it de it's dependent on technology to prove its point. It right. has to be able to produce the data. So that means that we have to it, it can lag behind because we have to wait for it to create. The machinery that can give us the data. Um, so an example I always give is you need a microscope to prove that bacteria exists. <laughs> so you right. look through the microscope and you can see it. Otherwise, you, you have no way of proving it to somebody. 
So now that we have this, um, you know, and we can prove that this is real, and this is this is what I said in the very beginning. I said that what the information that is out now wasn't out when I, you know, first wrote. I, I wrote the Practicing Mind actually in the early '90s, and then I, um, I self-published it first in around 2005, and then it got picked up by New World Library. But my point is, is a lot of that information that we have access to now, and that we know for sure wasn't available then. And I, I couldn't agree with you more. Like we are. I, I think one of the things I tell my clients is what I started to say is that <clears throat> every now and then stop thinking <laughs> and just close your eyes yeah. and feel, see what it feels like. And it, it is a faculty. And if you do it regularly, that faculty will grow in strength. And in fact, it will get to a point that many times the heart will just, it, it will give you a, a feeling just like your brain gives you a thought. Right. Um, and that you can trust a lot more. You know, if you're feeling fear, that's probably not the truth. You know, I mean, I, you know, I mean, I maybe I shouldn't say that, but I, I think that look at how you're, you know, like if you're making decisions based on fearful feelings, then that's not where you want to be. You, you know, you want to be in a place of peace um, and clear mind if you're going to be making decisions. And I think that that's one of the things we've seen over the last couple of years where um, there's been so much divisiveness, uh, you know. I mean, it's pretty well understood that, you know, when you're afraid, you go into fight or flight. And when you go into fight or flight, the blood flow goes out of the decision making uh, areas of the brain and goes into the flight areas of the brain, you know, the extremities, you got to run, you got to fight, you know, um, so our decision making ability, our faculties and decision making drops off when we become afraid. Um, and everything becomes automated. You know, that's um, right. somebody swings at you, you, your head just moves. That's because the subconscious takes over. You don't sit there and think, oh, here comes the punch. I should move my head this way or that way. So I think, again, this is, um, I think we're going to see in the next 15 years or so, this whole heart math thing, what it's going to be, what it's going to mean to to society and the world is in uh, as a whole is going to be absolutely amazing. Mm. Yay. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, I'm excited for the future and also terrified of the future with all the positive things happening, all the terrifying robotic things that are happening. Um, and on that note, uh, we have to wrap up this interview, Tom, but I wanted to say thank you so much for taking the time to come on to the show. Thank you for writing your book. I know it's going to help a lot of people. I know it already helped me. And if people wanted to find you on social media, do you have social media? A little bit. I don't do. A, I used to do a lot more. Um, I think probably Instagram would be, but um, they can get to that stuff really from my website, which you gave, you know, tomsterner.com. Um, they can also book a free half hour, you know, with me if they want to just talk and see if we can both decide whether we're a good fit with each other, if there's something I think I can help them with um, or not. Um, so uh, that's, you know, or if they want me to do a presentation, which I do many of, like um, they can also get in touch with me through there. Amazing. And where can people get your book on your website? There's links on the website. Yes. It's, a you know, like I think because um, the Practicing Mind and Full Engage are available pretty much every or in many places. But the uh, it's just a thought because it was just released like a month ago. Um, I don't know that it's made its way into all of the niche bookstores, but um, it's certainly available on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble, those types of places. Amazing. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much. And thank you for everyone who has listened to this episode. Thank you for joining us this week. If you don't already, please subscribe, rate, and review our show. And we will be back next week. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate your time. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on. It was great. Thanks, yeah. Tom. When, when I when I need to do some business stuff, I'll come out to Delaware. We'll grab a cup of coffee. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That sounds good to me. All Please. Right. Sounds good. Thanks for your time again. Okay. Bye-bye.